And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the upcoming comic Outlaw Knights, Genesis of, the, of a Renegade, the one and only, the fuse box, him, the fuse box himself, Ben Fusilier. How you do? How you doing today? And I know I hey. fucked it up. <laughs> oh, that dude! I'm so used to it. It's totally cool, man. I am having a great night. Thank you so much for having me on. Um, I would. Well, given where you're from, I would make a Saints joke, but if I need, but I just have to look at how the Saints play, and I and I already have the joke. I mean, yeah. <laughs> every every Saints game is pretty much like uh, the end of you know a major epic movie. You know, it's suspenseful, and you know the odds are always against us, and it's usually a miracle if we win. You know, I fig I figured it was just an excuse for everybody to get drunk on Bourbon Street. Uh, dude, like every every holiday we have is an excuse to get drunk on Bourbon Street. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, that, oh, that and the biggest holiday over there is li it literally translates to Fat Tuesday. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> but a bit of a tradition is to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Now, with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through what where the um, where the writing bug bit you. And what what um got what got you into um, comics, both just as a fan and as a writer slash creator? Well, growing up, I was always kind of a casual fan of comics. Like I really didn't like I would buy compilations or I would read certain certain specific ones. Like I wasn't, you know, I wasn't nuts about them, but. I did get into them for a while. Um, I didn't get into the major superhero franchises just because I felt like they were those were way too big for me at the time. <laughs> um, but uh, growing up, um, I started, you know, I really started getting into the to storytelling in general. And for a while, that that took me uh, into film school. Mm hmm. And so, because uh, I originally wanted to mainly do films, um, but ever uh, ever since I left college and everything, um, well, I graduated. I didn't leave, but, you know, um, ever since I graduated, uh, I started kind of deciding to broaden out my idea of it because I think I was, I was hyper-focused in one area, but I realized that my main passion came from just crafting like a screenplay in and of itself like just telling the story so i started playing around and um i had this idea for outlaw knights uh i bet i had it was sort of a fun side project in my mind like i was just playing with it and with in my free time and i wasn't really taking it too seriously um and so that went on for years and then in recent years uh about two or three years ago, um, I caught wind of everything that's been going on with independent comic book production. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was impressed and I was really like, I admired uh, the structure here. Like I like the idea that people are sort of starting their own stories from the ground up, like grassroots movement, uh, direct to consumer. Um, I thought that was great. I thought that was awesome. And I wanted to get in on that. Like I was like, well, you know, I, I haven't written anything in a hot minute and I want to get, get into it and I want to get hard. Well, you know what I mean? I want to get serious about it. Um, and so I finally was like, I was brainstorming like, well, what would I do for a comic? And then of course, you know, smack my head. I'm like, well, wait a minute. I've had, I've been sitting on an idea for a while now. Why don't I make a comic out of outlaw nights? And Outlaw Knights has gone through a lot of different transformations over the years. Like at first it was a novel idea. I started writing a novel. I didn't like that. I didn't like the way um, it was going. 
uh, tried to write a screenplay out of it. And it was like, it was okay, but, you know, it was the kind of thing I could never dream of producing myself. <laughs> um, so then giving it a shot, writing it as a comic screenplay or as a comic book uh, script. Mm hmm. And then handing that off to an artist and everything, like I, I realized that the struct that storytelling style in comic books actually works a lot better for this story than say like I think a movie. So everything kind of clicked into place with this project. And uh it's been gaining more and more momentum and I'm really excited about it. Mm -hmm. Now when it comes now let's talk let's talk about that concept so how did um with outlaw knights original form how did that come about was it was it something that you started kicking around when you're when you were in college as as part of your uh, film studies or what or was there a different route you know it was just i think it actually started earlier than college i think i was in high school and um it was it was kind of nebulous. It was just like I was always imagining stories and stuff. It was just like it was almost a compulsion. And um, and it was just one that I was starting to craft based on. Uh, I was really into the concept of pirates at the time. Mm -hmm. um, the Pirates of the Caribbean movie had like just come out and I, it had like I, I like the fact that they were taking a different approach with this genre. And so it just got me brainstorming about like a different type of pirate story, like something uh, detached from uh, most of the stereotypes that we're used to. Um, and it just kind of started building from there because it was sort of like, in my mind, it was like a fun heist movie kind of thing slash, you know, war with some great world building on top of it. Um so yeah, it's always just been a fun escape. Mm -hmm. And so um I'm really excited to to finally solidify it and get it out there. All right, I can I can de I can definitely get behind that kind of thing. Now, you mentioned um you mentioned getting getting into um pirates, but yeah. Given that was Outlaw Knights originally a a more pirate themed story, and then it just evolved into a space opera, or was that the case from the get go? It was always kind of the from the get go. It was always gonna be uh, pirates in a space opera setting, because um, I was thinking in terms of like you know, like um, I was thinking in in sort of action movie terms back then and I was just mm -hmm. like, you know, what's what's more fun action, you know, and it's like you want to have fun like, you know, you want to have advanced weaponry, you want it to be kind of updated and modern and have, have an edge to it. But uh at the same time still kind of uh playing out the themes, I guess, um from swashbuckler type stories as well as like westerns and um things kind of like uh blah, blah, blah. kind of lost my train of thought there for a second <laughs> but, um... <laughs> yeah no i was yeah it, i was drawn on westerns and i was drawn on um swashbuckler themes and stuff uh heist movies pretty much that theme of of you know the fun renegade um mm -hmm kind of that you know it's the spark that draws everybody to characters like uh, han solo and stuff you know the fun adventure that's not um you know with your character who isn't really uh your traditional good guy mm -hmm. and when it comes when it comes to that let's let's talk about the character of cyrus who for for all intents and purposes, Cyrus Lawson is the protagonist of this particular tale. Yep. Um, when it when you mention the whole the whole um, not the tr not the traditional good not the traditional good guy is is that what you were draw is that what you were drawing from when it came to Cyrus somebody who is the who is the who would be the grizzled veteran in a traditional western. 
your um roost your like say rooster in true grit no, I wouldn't really go that like that. Um, he's more of I would consider Cyrus to be more of like the naive uh, guy who who is trying to be uh, he's trying to be a, a, a book, a comic book type hero. But um, reality is is smacking him in the face. <laughs> um. Because that that sort of thing is like he's he's gonna have to learn to adapt to you know the fact that there's really no clear cut uh, right and wrong in the situations that he's confronted with, mm -hmm. and he's also kind of a um, and he and he starts off that um, kind of feel kind of with sort of a little bit of a uh, moral superiority thing going on. Which is gonna have to, you know, we're gonna have to chip away at that. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing that moral superiority is fr is from the fact that he's that he's a he's essentially a um essentially a a would it be fair? The vibe that I always got from his from his appearance is a bit of, is a bit of a um enforcement background. Kind of. Kind of, I think it's more like he's sort of being, he's sort of this little guy being whisked along for the ride. Um, and he's just kind of trying to keep up. And, um, you know, he's, and he's pretty much being forced to kind of confront his worldview, I guess. Um, cause I think, you know, in the, the way our story kind of starts off, he's pretty much, He's pretty much trying to get away from it all. You know what I mean? He's like, there's a lot going on in his time period, which I think we can all relate to. <laughs> um, and he's sort of, he's trying to, I guess, simplify it. But, you know, pretty much right off the bat, um, you know, danger and adventure are forcing their way in <laughs> to yeah, his life. I can see that. And um, I do want to, I do I do want to point out one one minor thing that I get, that I got a kick out of, and that is the fact that um, the design the design of his revolver, you know, be, being a being a bottom barrel instead of a top instead of a top barrel. <laughs> um, I think the the I um a the snarky end of me would ask if you were watching Ghost in the Shell when you were come, when you were picking that kind of revolver. Well, you know, weirdly enough, like. I, like weirdly enough, render our artist. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the one who really did most of the design choices. Uh, like when I wrote the script, mm -hmm. I literally for the guns, I just wrote like futuristic handgun, futuristic machine gun, futuristic shotgun. <laughs> you know, and he just kind of. So I didn't. So he built that off. You know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Now. The re the reason why I br bring up the whole bottom loader thing is that's um that was that was using what that was using the Mateba was which was popularized in um go in Ghost in the Shell, um. Oh damn. It. The reason the reason why a revolver would tr would um attempt to use the bottom barrel is less flip up. The reason it's not used all that often is you got to move a bunch of stuff around and it's more expensive. Okay. <laughs> um but give but given th given that and the f um the other thing I'm curious about and I'd like you to kind I'd like you to kind of expand on the context of this wording is it's set, it's it's stated on the Indiegogo page that Cyrus Lawson works as a security officer in a remote strategically useless colony. Um Yep. Is that is that a fancy way of saying that he works out in the boonies? Yes. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Therese is a small colony that is pretty much like the British um, have control of it at um, at the point of our story. But I mean, it's kind of like it's there. It's mainly just part of this pissing contest they have going with other nations and. 
it's really yeah it's like i was saying it's like it's got pretty much no real resource value it's got no str strategic value in a military aspect it's just it's next to worthless you know mm -hmm. and when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to the um that per the other th when it comes to the whole colony thing i'm guess i'm guessing that the vibe that you're going with is that by the, by the 31st century um casual space travel is is um a, is a, is a far more wide open thing so that's why you have this this essentially a second age of exploration is that yeah. the vibe you're going for we're all all these different countries or anybody that can is setting up colonies on on any world that they can get their hands on yep exactly history oh. repeating itself and because because of that and since you mentioned that it since you mentioned the whole pissing contest the thing that instantly comes to mind is the 100 year pissing contest that britain had with spain yep I mean, like that's that's pretty much the theme of of the thing is that uh, you know, ultimately our our pirates um are you know they they function similarly to the way pirates were in history, where a lot of them were kind of you know ex military, ex navy, um who had just kind of broken off and decided to just renounce all ties mm -hmm. to all of the entities at hand and kind of form their own little mini. Uh, sl sl you know, slapped together kind of governments, um, things like that. And, you know, and of course, there's going to be issues of colonies that are vying for independence and stuff, colonies that are pretty much steeped as war zones, you know, um, steeped in as war zones, I guess I should say. <laughs> but yeah. Like I, I like playing around with the idea of it's like this is this is manifest destiny 2.0. Mm -hmm. It's, um, it's colonization and now it's like throughout the vast expanse of space. It's like the map can't get filled up that quick, you know. Mm -hmm. And because because of that, um, a lot a lot of times when it. Obviously, th obviously, this is a vast simplification when it comes to the when it comes to the age of piracy. But I think in a lot, I think in a lot of the, if I recall, in a lot of those cases, the early some a lot of the a lot of um, pirates from that era started out as um, corsairs, i.e., legal pirates. Or yeah, you can you can f you can fuck shit up, but just but but it but um so long as Do you're it. fucking their shit up. Yeah, it's like fuck up our enemies. <laughs> oh yeah, there's gonna be some privateers coming later on in the series. Mm -hmm. Um, and give, given that, given that, especially with, especially with the way we've way you've set up, um, Cyrus, is it a case where his call to adventure is wrong place, wrong time? Yep. Um, totally wrong place, wrong time. Which that brings us to Ivory and the crew of the um ha and the crew of the Hazard. Um, what can you tell me as far as the kind of character that uh, that Ivory is in in um contrast to someone like Cyrus? Well, that's perfect because in many ways, like the heart of the story uh, revolves around their contrast. Um. And around some ways, they used to be similar because um, uh, Ivory's a little bit older than he looks. Uh, I think he's in his um, mid forties. Because um, the idea is, I made it to where, uh, you know, at this point in the future, uh, our human longevity has increased a bit to where, you know, people retain youth a little bit longer, mm -hmm. um, stuff like that. But. Uh, Ivory, uh, I can tell you, I don't want to give too much of his backstory away because that's gonna that's gonna be important stuff for later on. But um, I just wanted to say, like, he's 
it's like in some ways he used to be kind of like Cyrus, but um, he became jaded pretty quickly. And uh, he's very sarcastic, though. He's 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 the fun wise ass. Mm hmm. But uh, he does have a he does have an edge to him. He does have a bit of a dark side. And um, but I would say that uh, he's he's more mischievous than straight up like you know asshole. Um, but he he does have you know he does have have a have a temper. Let me put it that way. <laughs> but uh, he's yeah he's he's pretty much like you know. Cyrus is very, I guess I would put it as like Cyrus is kind of straight laced and, you know, wants to do it, do things right by the right way. You know, uh, Ivory's kind of lax. He's he's literally like he's literally drinking. Well, he's an alcoholic. I know that's another thing. Um, so he's literally drinking his whiskey right there in the captain's chair, you know, mm -hmm. chilling with his with his vape cigar, you know, like he's that he's that kind of captain like the. The bridge is meant to be more fun than it is, you know, anything else. But um, any any he, and he goes by he goes by his whims, but he does have deeper reasons for that that are going to be fleshed out a little bit later. Yeah, um, since there's since there's been a lot of um, a lot of a lot of um, pirate analogies with a story like Outlaw Knights. Are there are there any pirates in fiction that you that you could say you that may have that served as a inspiration or you may have used as a template to draw upon? Not specifically, no. Um, I mean, I did a lot of research on pirates before, and like I was, you know, I loved the story of like Blackbeard because I mean, some of that stuff almost came right out of a. A story like a legend mm -hmm. like the way he was uh but um the main thing i drew on were were just kind of the the some of the stories of the feats that people achieved like um when i was reading about henry morgan um as a privateer and how he pulled off this massive he pulled off this awesome strategic victory against this spanish fort where you know they had they had placed a bunch of dummy ships in the in the in the um in the river so that like you know when when uh when the spanish were looking out that way you know they they thought from far away it looked like they were manned ships but they were actually lined with gunpowder <laughs> <laughs> and they act and they pretty much set them off when the spanish got close enough and it, and it was a huge distraction while they attacked them on the landward side mm -hmm. it was just like stories like that you know that that's kind of what helped draw me into this because it's like it made me think of it made me think of pirates almost in the same way you'd think of like the crew from Ocean's Eleven, hey, where it's I, like you, it's all about outsmarting your opponent and stuff. I I can de I can definitely see that and give and given that particular um, comparison, I'm guessing that the that the way the way things would go about Cyrus is certainly the focus but you have a bit of you have a bit of elements from an ensemble kind of story with yeah the crew of the hazard exactly mm -hmm. now when it comes to the when it comes to the, the confrontation about the notion of right of right and wrong is it mo is that more in the sense that Cyrus is Cyrus up until this point has had a very straight laced approach about the about right and wrong and be and getting swept up with the with the crew of the hazard that's being tested because of the more because of the moral grayness that he's that he's seeing with everything or is there a different approach that's pretty much it for the most part um Cause it's, I mean, he he had a he also had kind of a traumatic uh, upbringing, um, and I'd say like that essentially soured him towards uh, pirates completely. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, like you were, it's like you were, like you were positing. Um, yeah, it's that he's he's confronted with the fact that you know these pirates are not 
quite the the monsters that he was imagining them to be and the situation going on with the governments uh the governments are not uh are not exactly the the super straight laced good guys that they like to that they want you to believe they are so you know it's it's playing around with the notion that you know real life it's like right and wrong are not so clearly defined mm -hmm. in every aspect but it's also playing around with it in a fun way with mm -hmm. guns and action and <laughs> yeah now when it comes now um when it comes to the fact that you you set this up as a six as a six series um, arc, but even even with that, do you ha do you have it set up where where um, this particular issue is still is still going to work just as fine as a standalone story? I think so. Um, uh, initially, this issue was going to be fifty pages. Um, and due to issues with like uh, the fundraising and just budgeting, um, we just I decided that it would be wiser to cut it in half and present the next half as uh, the next issue. And so, so I'm probably going to end up extending it to about seven or eight issues mm -hmm. um, because of that. But uh, as a result of uh, having to cut it in half, I really didn't want to. But um, I think it ends uh, on a pretty, on a nice cap moment. You know what I mean? Like um, there is a self-contained story in this first issue. Um, it's just not as long as I wanted it to be. But you know. <laughs> yeah, I can. I can definitely get. I can definitely um, get that particular sentiment. Um. And when it and um, when it came to when it came to the um art when it came to the art specifically your um, artist who you, who you mentioned, was it was it a case where you where um you got in contact with him or was it the other way around? How did you two meet up and get and um, agreed to to get started on this whole project? Oh yeah, I was I went on the hunt. I I was starting this thing totally from scratch. So after I completed a script, after I completed a draft of the script, uh, I started just looking for artists um, just on social media. I was just looking through peop uh, different artists' portfolios. And uh, I found a render. And when uh, I looked through his, his work... Um, I realized, you know, I was like, this is this is the type of style that I would love to see this story in. Because, um, you know, I was like, I in my mind, I had sort of an idea of how I wanted it to look. And so I just I messaged him and uh, and I sent him a sample of it. And I just asked if he'd be interested in in me commissioning him. And uh, he took a look at it, and he messaged me back, and he said he that he liked it, and that he wanted to work on it. And I was just elated, you know, like and and it worked out really well at the time because um, he was telling me how he was actually, you know, looking to do something like sci-fi or space, you know, space opera. -y. You know, he was he was actually, you know, looking for some kind of story to do to be able to draw some sci-fi elements. So like that, it just clicked. Everything worked out perfectly. Yeah. Now when it comes to, when it comes, when it comes to the fact that you're doing essentially a SF um, space opera, um, the thing that's always going to be, that's always going to be challenging when trying to tackle this particular genre of fiction is the sheer amount of possibilities when it comes to what sort of science fiction you're do you're doing because ev because you're answering a series of questions and those answers provoke more questions um yeah and when when you were, when you were developing this this um setup were did you end up spending a lot of time just fo just focusing on what sort of science fiction world you wanted to present? Um, 
I did I did most of that before I started writing. Um I did that mostly over the years just kind of refining like how I would just think about the setting. Mm -hmm. Um and I came to a point where uh you know, I came to a point where I didn't want it to mimic too much of what I've already seen. And one of the biggest elements of that was that I wanted this particular story to be slightly more grounded in a different way where, um, like, for example, like most stories like this, you have sentient alien races that are, you know, intelligent as humans or possibly more intelligent. In my version, like the only aliens we see are animals, instinct based creatures. Um and humans, at at least as it stands, um, are pretty much kind of alone. Um, and this is still very much an, an age of sort of new exploration. So that we can combine elements of the new frontier along with um, more futuristic elements of being able to set up like, you know, a cool looking little metropolis mm -hmm. as like a colony, you know, with a with sealed in air dome. Um, so yeah, you know, pretty much in that vein, because I would say that this is more, this is more character driven. Oh, all right. I can certainly, I can certainly get that. Um, since you met, you mentioned, given what you mentioned in that, I'm curious if there were, if there were any ideas early on that as you were developing the world of Outlaw Knights, just weren't compatible and had to get tossed yeah i was initially i like i think like i had thought of a bunch of versions of it that, that like, i i had even forgotten some <laughs> um because i'd actually um one of one of my exes actually got in touch with me um because she had backed the campaign or whatever and she was like yeah i remember you talking about this back in the day and yeah, like I, the pictures I saw were totally different from what you were talking about. I was like, "What do you mean?" And she was like, "Yeah, you were talking about like guys wearing suits and and all that." <laughs> like, you know, because like initially, I think most of the characters were just going to be dressed in like regular men's attire. Like, it wasn't going to be anything unique or or flashy. And like, I was gonna. I think I even had an idea where like Cyrus was gonna be a journalist at one point, who's like who was had a, like a failing marriage or something, and realized like how worthless that was, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, there've been a lot of evolutions of it. Now, with that. When it comes to when it comes to setting up the world, one of the big ones that I always I always end up asking, especially when you're dealing with any sort of casual interstellar travel, is how faster than light works. Because there's multiple ways to go about it. You can go the um and you can go the high speed travel at at any point. I also known as the Star Trek and Star Wars method. You can go the specific points approach, i.e. um something like um, Cowboy Bebop or um, Wing Commander or somewhere in between. How how do you have it set up? Um, for the most part, I was thinking about sort of a hyperspeed type of setup, but not quite as uh, efficient. Because <laughs> um, I wanted the... Uh, I do wanted most of the, the space travel, at least like traveling from one planet to another to seem like it at least would take a, a few days. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like I, I am sort of doing like a hyper speed kind of thing, but not necessarily like a hyper space thing. Well, in, in the, so, but ev even with that speed, is it a case where, people could only achieve that speed from certain points that's what that's why i referenced um reference something like wing commander where where um ftl travel can only happen on jump points yeah or is it a is it a case where it can be activated anywhere it's just it's just still going to take time going between 
um, sectors? I would say it can be activated anywhere, but there are certain jurisdictions where there's a legal way to proceed. Much much like much like how you have much like staying on the road when it comes to you when it comes to using landed vehicles. Exactly. <laughs> well, that that in the whole if you're not registered, that in the whole registration registration and the like, since obviously a a British ship showing up in the middle in the middle of another another country's territory might might get a warning of of um slow of slow down or we shoot you on sight. Yep. Um. Oh yeah, international incidents happen all the time. <laughs> taking that taking that into taking that into account, if you were if you were to have, given this particular um particular setup, what between pl between planets, how lo how long would that take? Like, for instance, how how long would it take for someone to go from Earth to Mars in this? Um, I would say about a day or two. A day or two, and it would probably take a week in the case of, say, Earth to Uranus. Um, maybe a little bit less. A little bit less, like, in, like say, three days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when it comes, when it comes to. Some sometimes SF works have their own little set have their own little setting exclusive, um, for lack of a better term, MacGuffin when it comes to either when it comes to either fuel or me or means of tech. Is there some is there something like that in this setup, or would that be too much of a spoiler? Um, not I wouldn't call it so much of a MacGuffin, like because they they do refuel. Like there are stations where you have to refuel, but um, it's it's efficient because the idea is uh, the periodic table has increased, obviously, because we've been discovering new elements and new fuels and such on different mm -hmm. planets. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it might be kind of a MacGuffin. <laughs> Well, there's a, there's always a there's always the old saying of the good possibility of a definite maybe. <laughs> but when it com but when it comes to, now when it comes to the when it comes to the page count you you said that that um you're probably gonna have it at tw at twenty five pages long. Yep. Um. Now, even though it's going to be at that length, are you? Pl is it still going to be? Is that twenty-five pages still going to be in a three-act setup, or is it going to be a? Or is it going to be just this continuous um, pace when it comes to the story? I think it's a pretty continuous pace. Um, there, I mean, there are kind of little structural. Um, you know, it, it it moves along at a at a decent. Uh, stride but I yeah I don't know if it would I don't know if I could necessarily pinpoint certain uh, points where you'd be like oh this is a plot point right here this is the plot you know um because you know it pretty much I would I can tell you that the first issue pretty much is contained as like the big inciting incident of the story um but uh, it does introduce us to the to the characters in the world, and it gives us a sense of who of you know who people are, and and it gives us a sense of urgency. <laughs> Which I'd say that de I'd say that definitely I'd say that definitely fits. Yeah. Um. Mm. Now, you now. Um. I do want to even. The, I do want to give out my my congratulations on the amount that you've that you've currently had. Now it's now currently it's in in demand. Um. Yeah. How how long do you how long do you plan on having it in um in that particular state? 
Oh, well, thank you so much. Um, yeah, um, I think my big my main plan is uh, I'm definitely going to keep it up um, through fulfillment, um, which is uh, the book is going to be done by the end of this month. Uh, and then we are going to start fulfilling right away as soon as, you know, putting in the order and everything. And I'm going to keep everybody updated um, as we're doing it. Um, and then I'm pretty much going to keep the campaign active through that point and i may take it down sometime uh like in the beginning of june just depending on um what what it's looking like at that point because uh, i would you know i would like to get some more backers in on it just to you know just to get the word out but um i am planning on launching uh the indiegogo for issue two um either in somewhere in mid june or early july mm -hmm. depending um so it all just depends on uh when i get a when i get a date nailed down for when i'm going to launch the second campaign um i'll be able to have a more solid idea of when this one will end but i'm keeping it a little bit loose All right, I can de I can definitely I can definitely see the reason for that, um, and be and beyond th beyond that, um, now given that given that unless uh, that um that this is your first go this is your first go when it comes to this particular project, um, what would you say have been so have been some of the big takeaways you've learned in um in trying to crowdfund this? A uh, big thing, I, the biggest takeaway I learned in crowdfunding is like it's all about it's all about getting out there on, you know, getting yourself out on YouTube shows, on people's channels, on people's podcasts. And, you know, it's just get out there and meet people. And, you know, I mean, you, you know, pretty much guys like you are the reason that I succeeded. Like, you know, I wouldn't have succeeded without y'all. Um, so like, it's, yeah, it's vital to just get out there and introduce yourself and, you know, don't do it the way I did it with my first campaign, which is where I was just, all I did was advertise on Twitter and that was it. And, <laughs> and it didn't work. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's def that's definitely a good. Advertising on just one platform is definitely a first step, but there's there's it's quite clear that the that these days that's just that's just one aspect, especially when yeah. especially when Twitter would 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 rather people talk about the hot take of the week and well for for something <laughs> like this that's just not going to be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, but with all that said. I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity at play here in the temple. Thank you, man. I appreciate the heck out of it. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> kind of necessary mm -hmm. in 2021. I didn't That'll... say that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need an excuse to drink. <laughs> like everybody everybody's doing the whole 2020 2021 makes me makes me want to drink. I'm like you need you need current year to make you want to drink. <laughs> but and, and of course a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who take who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! Woo!